Morning, Embassy Radio. My name is Corey Rosen, and welcome to the Story Podcast. Today, I have a super awesome guest, but before we get into that, if you would like to support what I do or the show, please go over to our shop. You can buy some merchandise. We have stickers, and we have hoodies and shirts with the first 50 guests on the back, and those are limited edition. They will run out in September, so be sure to get yours now. With that said, I have on a super awesome dude, Mr. John Flavin. John Flavin is the lead singer and manager of the Ogham Stones, a seven-member Celtic rock band in Lancaster, PA. The band formed in the fall of 2010 and performed their first gigs on St. Patrick's Day, no less. 2011, they reached, they released an album, 1-2-F-U, in 2015. John is also a registered member of the One of One, sorry, One of the Thousand, the biggest rock band on earth on October 20. 2020, oh my gosh, that's a lot of 20s, <laughs> he participated in the Rocking 1000 Global Gig, which set a Guinness World Record for the most videos in a music medley video. For most of the 1990s and early 2000s, John was a bartender and manager at the Chameleon Club and was lucky enough to meet and work with many of his favorite bands and performers. He continues to work with Richard Wolf, who is the Chameleon Club founder and owner, as a stage manager at Lancaster Roots and Blues Festivals. John is also the organizer of Lancaster Drum <laughs> Lancaster <laughs> Strummer Jam, a music event that celebrates the life, vision, and music of Joe Strummer of The Clash. This event benefits the Joe Strummer Foundation, an international charity that promotes music, musicianship around the world. And this year, the Lancaster Strummer Jam will be held on August 21st, Strummer's birthday, at Phantom Power in Millersville. Check out John and his projects at the www.theogstone, sorry, theoghamstones.com or check out the 2022 Lancaster Summer Jam event at, at uh, facebook.com. You can find all these links in the description. Also find the Joe, the Joe, Joe Strummer Foundation at joestrummerfoundation.org and you can find his stuff on Spotify. John, how are you doing today? Great, Corey. Thanks for having me. Yeah, man. I'm really excited to talk about uh, all the events that you're planning and all the stories that you could have at the Ch Chameleon. <laughs> I'm curious, what got you into music in the first place? What got you into the industry? What What was it? Uh, um, I, I was joking earlier. You know, I'm borrowing, a, I'm, I'm, I'm clipping a line here from uh, the movie High Fidelity. Um, I've always been a what I would consider to be a professional music appreciator. I love music. Um, got turned on to new wave and punk rock in the 80s, you know, when I was still in high school, you know, dug music all the way through college, seeing live shows as often as I possibly could, um, you know, kind of expanding my repertoire to, to loving, you know, all sorts of music, but especially, like I said, um, you know, Celtic music, Irish music, rockabilly, uh, all those things. Um, so that led me into... Uh, my one of my dream jobs that I ever had in my life was working at the Chameleon Club. So you know, besides being a bartender, which is pretty lucrative, uh, you know, getting to uh, get to meet you know tons and tons and tons of musicians, bands, you know, learning kind of the ins and outs of putting on live performances, you know, from you know the behind the scenes uh, kind of you know perspective. Who do you think was your most favorite band or artist to work with? Oh, uh, there were so many, so many, so many, so many. Um, Probably, visually, and and just working with her was was fantastic. It was Patty Smith? Mm. Um, she came to the Chameleon Club and just put on an, an incredible show. Um, like I said, with with just not just fantastic music musicianship, but you know just visually. I mean, her stage was great. Um, you know, she she was very interactive with the crowd, and then just to know her. I mean, she's the, you know the widely kind of considered a, the the godmother of punk really? and uh then to meet her afterwards you know i, I got to talk and, and see her during setup and you know in the green room backstage beforehand but then afterwards she just sat at the bar and and chatted and talked with people she really wanted to know and one of the most amazing things she did was you know at one point she asked me you know can you give me the names of everybody who's working tonight and of course i instinctively kind of went to uh oh was there a problem you know mm -hmm. <laughs> what's going on and she said, no, I, I just, you know, I want to give everybody something. And she gave everybody autographed copies of her book. That's crazy. It was amazing. I mean, just the fact that, you know, 
uh, I, I still have mine to this day, proudly, proudly displayed. That's awesome. What was it like to train? Correct me if I'm wrong, but you went from a bartender to a, a manager there. Um, you kind of did both mm-hmm. at the Chameleon. Um, I started off again. I've been friends with Rich Ruoff, you know, the owner, founder of the Chameleon, for a, a pretty long time. Um, for a while, he had a bar in the basement, uh, known as the Lizard Lounge, and um, for a while there, uh, it wasn't operating to full capacity and I was bartending at another bar in town and told Rich that I was you know really looking to try to you know maybe get into the chameleon what could I do for him and he just kind of said anytime you want to open the lounge that that's great you know you can kind of have that Mm. um which was awesome you know anytime basically I kind of made my own hours if I wanted to you know I'd look at the the monthly schedule and be like I'll open it this day this day this day this day this day um and then from there, kind of wanted to work my way upstairs, you know, to working a lot of the bars. Eventually, Greg Barley, who now owns Phantom Power, took over as full-time manager of the, of the Lizard Lounge down in the basement. So, again, everything comes full circle. Um, and then when I got upstairs, um, it just kind of happened that, you know, I'd be the person saying, okay, I'll come in early today to be there when the band gets there, you know, and that kind of turned into you know, shift manager stuff, which was just basically collecting drawers and making sure everything worked, you know, but I was also bartending at the same time. So, mm. um, but yeah, it was, it was, it was just a fantastic time uh, when, you know, the chameleon was, was, you know, vibrant and we were, you know, we were doing shows, you know, sometimes every day of the week, but, you know, at least four or five days out of the week and, you know, everything was, everything was awesome. If you could give any tips to any upcoming bartenders, what would it be? Uh, um, don't go to bartending school. That's, <laughs> you don't, I mean, you know, learning drink recipes, you can do that on your own. Don't pay anybody to, to teach you drink recipes. And I always joke too, unless you're working in some, you know, uh, you know, place that does mixology, you know, uh, just know the basics, know what alcohol tastes like. I mean, that sounds, you know, maybe somewhat destructive, you know, <laughs> like, but if you know what tastes good together, you can make good drinks. Right. Um, uh, and then just learn to do everything eight times as fast as you're used to doing things. Did you ever go into any show tricks or and stuff? Because I've seen some bartenders who like, oh yeah, oh right, 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 the cocktail stuff. Um, yeah. No, no, we were just about trying to get the drinks across the bar as fast as possible most of the time. Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> Without a lot of flair, just service, fast service. Uh, that oftentimes that's what you need. Yeah, oh yeah. I mean, if you're uh, the chameleon, you know, could. You know, it, on on some shows we were full to the rafters. Yeah, and you know you might have people you know ten deep at the bar. You know, yeah, they don't want to watch you flipping shakers behind your back. They want their drinks fast so now. they can get back to watching the show. Yeah, exactly. So when at what point did you decide to go into music yourself? Um, it was like I said, I've always toyed with the idea um, of of you know starting a band in college. I with the idea of you know getting some people together and and we would you know maybe play like you know apartment parties and stuff like that but it was never anything that gelled you know just never anything um in t- about 2010 it was probably the summer of 2010 um another very good friend of mine um uh, jeff anderson who owns angry young and poor uh the the punk rock store and record shop downtown in lancaster uh i was at his house for an event just a party and you know he he handed me a CD and said, you got to listen to these guys, they're great. So, you know, popped it in when I got home and listened to it. It was a great Celtic rock band. And, you know, as I'm kind of being blown away by this, you know, how good they were, I'm, I'm thinking to myself, they've got to be from Boston, they've got to be from, <laughs> you know, New York, they've got to be from L.A., you know. And no, they were from Harrisburg. It was the Kilmaine Saints. Um, and it was, it was kind of an epiphany, you know, straw that broke the camel's back type of thing. I'm like, okay, uh, Lancaster needs a Celtic rock band. So uh, I reached out immediately to a very good friend of mine, Amanda, who plays the bagpipes. In fact, she was the bagpiper at my wedding and said, you know, how would you like to be in a, in a rock band? And she said, that's, I've been waiting for this, you know. <laughs> like, you know uh, so Every bagpiper's dream. Exactly, you know, to, to play with, you know, instrumentation. That's just going to make it that much better. Um and uh, I think we, you know, and then it just gelled, you know, pretty soon we had musicians, you know, uh, a full complement. I think it's a, we started with eight, 
um, and we started rehearsing and you know pulled together a you know, long set and then we were ready to go by St. Patrick's Day of 2011 and we've been cranking ever since. That's awesome. How does one uh, bring together a group of musicians because I've often heard or the line is that hurting musicians is like hurting cats. Hurting cats. Um, it's it, well, if, if you have people who are passionate about the project, you know, and that's really what we had. We had a lot of people who, you know, from the very beginning, you know, wanted to do this, wanted to see it work. Um, you know, fans of Celtic rock, fans of bands like the Pogues uh, or the Dropkick Murphys or Flogging Molly, you know, really wanted to. And that's pretty much what we do to this day is, you know, we either we, we um, I don't like the I don't like the term cover band. Because I think that makes it sound as if you know you're you're not doing anything original. Uh, we take other people's music, and we twist joke them. around. We twist them. We 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 joke. We like, we like to ogify them. So we'll take a you know a traditional tune that may have been done. You know either just by a public domain traditional Irish tunes that have been around for centuries, and we you know rock them up, or we'll take sometimes either just rock songs which you wouldn't necessarily associate with being in an Irish band. And we change the instrumentation. So we put in bagpipes, we put in, you know, accordion and fiddle and mandolin and all that other kind of stuff. And now suddenly it's an Irish song. So it's crazy how some songs feel like they were meant to be Irish. It's true. You're absolutely right. Um, again, one of your, your previous guests, Leo DeSanto, you know, of a Vinegar Creek constituency, wrote a song, which he, he intended, I'm sure, to be pretty much an Irish kind of pub song because it has perfect lyrics, you know. Uh, you know, um, wild winds of misfortune, and and you know, um, but he said to us, you know, said to me, uh, you know, hey, I've got this Irish tune, you know, that I wrote for Vinegar Creek constituency, um, but I'd like to hear your guys' take on it, and it's a fantastic song. The you know the bones were solid, so but then we just took it and rearranged it a little bit and play it differently than they do. So I make the joke a lot of time we're on stage. It's a song we borrowed from Leo and just haven't given back yet. <laughs> What do you think makes a Celtic song? Uh, lyrically, it's, you know, there's, there's a, we joke about this on stage all the time, you know, themes, um, you know, drinking, <laughs> you know, partying, merriment. Um, but a lot of times Irish songs can be, you know, very, very sad. Uh, they talk a lot about history. You know, we definitely do a, a section of our set where we, you know, we play songs about, you know, the Irish war for independence and, you know, and battle songs and mm -hmm. you know, songs about, you know, immigration is, a, is another great theme. Um, musically, it's, um, again, I think it really depends on, you know, very specific type of instruments. Uh, bagpipes, clearly one of them. Uh, accordion, tin whistle, uh, fiddle, you know, violin played <laughs> fiddle style, you know. Um, mandolin, banjo, you know, these are all the kind of uh, songs that, you know, the instruments that really, I think, when you put them together, really make a, a good Irish tune. You know, that really surprised me when you had the uh, the violin makes sense, the fiddle makes sense, the 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 mandolin and banjos caught me off guard because mm -hmm. I've always associated those with Americana. It, it, you know, well, very much so. But a lot of what we sometimes think of as Appalachian music was really just Scotch Irish, you know, and, mm -hmm. and that instrumentation you know came over. Um, I mean, the banjo is originally an African instrument, right? Of course, but, right? <laughs> yeah. but you know, it, it's you know, as, as soon as people got that wonderful, awesome twang out of it, you know, it, it really lends itself to you know, again. So a lot of the stuff you, you you sometimes think of as what we might call mountain music or Appalachian music is pretty much Celtic. That's interesting. Have you ever uh, had a hammer dulcimer? No, not in our band. Uh, that's a great idea. If, if there's any hammered, hammered dulcimists out there, dulcimerists, <laughs> you know, uh, we'll, 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 we'll have tryouts. That's something I've been working on. I've, I've, played, right? I've played a hammered dulcimer okay. before as a percussionist, and it's so much fun. Uh, it's such a unique instrument. It's something I've been trying to, or I want to invest more in. Okay. Because I feel like it's a, it's a ton of fun. Again, even percussion in a, in a Celtic rock band, we do, uh, besides having a full band, you know, with, with um, traditional, you know, drum kit set up, our, our drummer Sean also plays uh, the Balron, uh, which is the traditional Irish drum, the one you see people holding in their hands. Really? Uh, and sometimes when we're doing a more scaled back or acoustic set, instead of playing a full drum kit, he just plays the Balron. That's cool. I haven't seen one of those. Yeah, they're fun.
So, what is uh, what was the the, the reasoning behind the Ogham Stones? The name. The name. Um, we played around with a bunch of different songs, uh, or, or I'm sorry, titles uh, of the band when we first got started. Um, but then we played around with some funny plays on words. Uh, we were <laughs> very first name. I'm so glad we didn't go with this. It was going to be the Kilt Kennedys. Uh, again, Kilt referring to what we're, at least I was going to be wearing on stage, and then a you know a little tongue-in-cheek play on the dead Kennedys. Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, we, 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 we started rehearsing under that name and uh, quickly kind of went, okay, that's kind of dumb. <laughs> funny the first time you hear it, but less and less funny as it goes on. Right. Um, so we were looking for something more traditional, you know, that will little and... Um, I came up with a long list, and um, the Ogham Stones uh, was the one that, that everybody seemed to like the most, and you know, clearly we, we've fallen in love with it and, and stuck with it ever since. Ogham Stones are the very large monolithic standing stones that you see all over you know, Celtic Britain and Wales and you know, even the Brittany region of France. Um, so there's a couple pictures of them on our website you know, that we just threw in there. Uh, but you know, we like the, the solid permanence, you know, and then the reference to Celtic history. Yeah, it's a good, it's a good strong name too. Thank you. Welcome the Ogham Stones. The Ogham Stones, right? Exactly. Even with its different pronunciations, right? You know, we were course. talking about earlier. You know, the American pronunciation is is Ogham. Uh, in Ireland, you often you know Ogham, Ogham Stones, Ogham Stones. <laughs> So tell me, what is the uh, the the songs like? Is it is it original work? You you mentioned it was cover more of cover. Uh, uh, yeah, we'll either do covers of other people's stuff that, like I said, we do in our own style, or we take traditional tunes. You know, things that are just been around for, you know, decades, centuries. If not centuries, right? And and you know, do our own versions of them. Have you ever uh, gone to Ireland? I've, I've been twice. That? I've been twice. One time, I was very lucky to go. Uh, as a teenager, uh, through a, a, a student exchange program, um, and you know, at 17 years old, uh, I got to admit, you know, I was more interested in the nightlife and, and party aspect of it, well, of which course. was great. <laughs> which was, but over there you, you know, can drink at right, 17. <laughs> exactly right. Um, yeah, so to be able to walk into a pub, you know, and just be able to order a drink without anybody looking twice at you was fantastic uh, for a 17 year old American kid. Um, but I was very lucky in the, the, the family that I stayed with in Dublin really did want to immerse me, especially when they knew that, you know, uh, I'm Irish by mm. heritage and culture, um, you know, really immersed me. So I had the, the, the father of the family that I was staying with for a brief period of time in Dublin drive me around you know, and just, you know, take me to all these, you know, beautiful places like uh, Newgrange, which is an old uh, Celtic burial ground and the Hill of Tara, which is, you know, where many important battles were fought and the king's. The ancient kings of Ireland sat, and you know all these these fantastic places, which at the time I, I think I appreciated, but I look back now and say, oh my god, I, you know, I, I would have gotten so much more out of it as an adult. The next time I went back, um, I was probably in my thirties, which is still a long time ago, um, and uh, really just went on a whirlwind, kind of a long weekend thing. Um, which is still great, you know, Irish culture is amazing, meeting people in Ireland is fantastic, sit down at a pub and the person next to you is in, within 20 minutes is, is your lifelong friend. Yeah, I was about to say, it sounds like it's a very friendly culture over there, very open. Absolutely, absolutely. That's something I kind of wish, I, uh, the, the college, we were supposed to go over to Ireland for a tour, mm -hmm. and we were supposed it gets me a little upset. We were we were supposed to be uh, in Ireland not only for St. Patrick's Day, okay, but we were also supposed to perform in the St. Patrick's Cathedral. Oh, great! But the day of, it got canceled due to COVID. COVID, yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, COVID was ill timed that very first year that everything shut down. Literally, I was on the phone with about five different venues that we were supposed to play St. Patrick's Day shows for. Wow! And you know, kind of like you know, literally, is this going to happen? Is this not going to happen? And um, obviously, we very much erred on the side of caution. Mm -hmm. You know, we wanted to keep both ourselves and the audiences safe. So, yeah, that was that. That was that uh, first St. Patrick's Day. Literally, was the beginnings of the of the, the great shutdown. Yeah. 
So what what did you what did you do during that that time? Did you uh did you hunker down and and focus on songwriting, or did you hunker down and just <laughs> move stuff away? Or we um yeah we 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 definitely kept in touch. We we you know we made a concerted effort you know during the the, the great Zoom period you know to to make sure that we always you know met at least once a month just to you know keep you know touch with each other. Um, during that time was when I got into. Uh, you mentioned in the introduction um, the Rockin' 1000 project, mm -hmm. um, which is, if you've ever seen any of these videos, they're fantastic. Just just YouTube, you know, Rockin' 1000. Um, so basically it started real briefly. I'm not going to do their whole history, but um, there was a town in Italy that wanted the Foo Fighters to come play their town. Uh, and, you know, after That's many right. attempts at trying that. to get them to, to show up at their town... Uh, they were coming up, I think, a little bit short and, you know, not being able to garner a lot of interest. Uh, and um, they got the idea of, let's get a thousand musicians together, you know, to play a Foo Fighters song. So, you know, 200 drummers and 200 guitar players and, you know, 200. I remember this, yeah. And and uh, and it worked, you know. Dave yeah. Grohl eventually saw the, you know, the, the video went viral and, you know, Dave Grohl saw it and said, you know, yeah, let's go. And, you know, showed up and... and Fighters played this town. So that project just kind of kept going and got bigger and bigger and bigger to the point where they were selling out stadiums in Europe, uh, you know, with literally, you know, thousands of musicians, you know, playing the same songs at the same time. Uh, and, you know, so some of the, the videos, like I said, are amazing. You know, them doing Smells Like Teen Spirit and, and We Will Rock oh You gosh. and uh, Rage Against the Machine and you know, all this other kind of stuff. So I, you know, the videos got to me, and I was watching them and, and thinking, wow, this is incredible. And then there's the opportunity to actually join the thousand. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a process you go through where you kind of submit your, uh, you know, your resume, as it were, and, you know, demonstrate you're a performer. Um, and then for the pandemic, during the pandemic, obviously there weren't going to be these huge stadium shows, uh, but they did was something called the Global Gig, uh, where they invited people to uh, do their own uh, recordings, uh, both video and audio, of you know a small set of songs that they were doing, and then they compiled all the videos that everybody sent into into one great huge montage, which was worldwide broadcast from the Global Village in Dubai, and so you know on one of the tracks, um, a cover of uh, Joey Ramone doing uh, "Wonderful World," mm -hmm. and. There's there's my little video and in, included in the montage, you know, of all that. So that's pretty cool. It was fun. So that was again, you know, we did what we could to try. As soon as the pandemic restrictions uh, started to lift and people started getting vaccinated, um, we were glad to go back to doing uh, St. Patrick's Day gigs. But for the first year, we went back to doing it. It was only outdoors. You know, it had mm. to be an outdoor venue. Um, so. It was. It was. It seemed like a, a long time coming back, but you know, happy to, happy to be here again. Yeah. So tell me about the the process behind getting into the Strummer Jam. Uh, what what's that like? Strummer Jam. Um, once again, something I, I discovered online. Uh, Joe Strummer and, and and the Clash have been one of my favorite bands uh, since um, high school. Uh, I got turned on. You know, like many people did, you know, seeing Rock the Casbah video on MTV, you know, and anxiously awaiting that video to come back on again the next time so I could watch the armadillo run across the street and, you know, everything mm -hmm. like that. Um, but, of course, you know, even after The Clash broke up, Joe Strummer went on, you know, to do many things on his own as well as forming another band, The Mescaleros, and I loved all their albums and everything about them. Um, so when he passed away in 2002, obviously there was a lot of uh, sadness, um, but what came out of that was his widow and several of his close associates formed the Joe Strummer Foundation, um, an international uh, charity to benefit uh, musicians and musicianship. Um, so they started doing what were called Strummer Jams right around the time of, of Joe Strummer's birthday, you know, all over the world. Uh, in fact, they, at one point they had an interactive map where you could track what was going on in the month of October, October 21st being Joe Strummer's birthday. Um, and 
all these places, these venues, you know, or these organizations would put on these jams where people would just get together. Um, Joe Strummer was very famous for having these big outdoor events, um, you know, where basically they just light a bonfire and people would gather to play music and talk. And, you know, it was, it was, uh, it was uh, you know, actors and, and poets and philosophers and musicians and all these people would just get together to, to share ideas with one another. So that was the idea behind these drummer jams. Um, so in 2017, uh, we got one together here uh, in, in uh, Lancaster. Um, we had it out at Chickie's Rock Outfitters, um, which was a great you know, place that would offer us a big outdoor venue. Kind of the idea was we'd do the music and then you know, maybe then just do the same thing, light a bonfire and everybody could just hang out. Um, unfortunately, that one got rained out. We, mm. we got started, and then <laughs> we, uh, about halfway through, it opened up on us, and we had to you know, scramble to, to put everything away. And, um, but it was a good initial start. It helped me not only kind of get the organizational stuff together, but also got what we now refer to as the house band together, you know, a bunch of other people who, just, again, very much love the music of, of The Clash and Joe Strummer, um, so that was in 2017, our half, half, half attempt to pull one of these off. And then um, in 2019, one of the people who was participating in that first one, uh, Mike Giblin, um, organized a charity event at TELUS 360 um, for uh, the Susan Giblin Foundation, which is a, a, a charity event to benefit uh, the Humane League and... and uh, and uh, support animals and animal uh, protection. Um, and it was his vision. They had done other ones before where they would, you know, uh, cover a band's entire album as a tribute. Mm. So this year they wanted to do London Calling by The Clash, their very famous third double album. Third album, which was a double album. Um, and I was really happy that they invited me to, to participate in that as well. So uh, that event was was gangbusters i mean we we packed telus uh everybody who came loved it it was it was really really successful and, and uh so that was in like i said 2019 obviously there was maybe talk about re redoing strummer jam again until covid mm -hmm. <laughs> hit and you know put that off for a couple years um so this year will be five years since we did the first one and this time we chose a venue uh, in which we can be outdoors at Phantom Power in Millersville. We'll be out in their beer garden area. But if weather turns against us, we can go inside. So, you know, <laughs> we're covering our bets. Um, so basically, uh, we're coordinated with the Joe Strummer Foundation, and all the uh, proceeds from this charitable event will go to, to benefit the Joe Strummer Foundation. Um, we're going to have a huge auction, uh, raffle type, or raffle style auction. Um, we have about 15 or 20 uh, really fantastic local businesses have donated some great gifts, uh, a lot of gift certificates, but actually some also some, some art, uh, some you know, gift baskets, things like that, which will you know, all be uh, raffled off. Um, the cost of the admission for the event is $10, but again, all that's going to, to charity. Uh, the musicians are all playing. Um, so again, we got a lot of great local musicians. Leo DeSanto, we already mentioned, uh, is going to be uh, performing both an acoustic set as well as with the house band. The great, fantastic punk band Jet Silver is going to do a, a set of their favorite Clash tunes. And then the house band uh, is going to get up and people are going to be rotating kind of on and off stage you know, as we examine all of Joe Strummer's music uh, from his first band, the 101ers, all the way through his solo stuff and Mescalero stuff and then just every at least one song off of every Clash album. That's cool. Yeah. And so uh, how long would that event be? Um, we're hoping, well, we, we gates are going to open around noon at Phantom Power. We want to get everyone in there and get them buying raffle tickets and you know enjoying just the, the, the atmosphere uh, and then music should kick off around one and we're thinking it should go at least two, two maybe two and a half hours. Oh wow! Yeah, that'd, so that'd be a, a nice little after Sunday afternoon. Absolutely, August twenty first, right? August twenty first at Phantom Power. Phantom Power in Millersville. And if you want to check out something after that, you can go over to Tell Us Three Hundred and Sixty, because after then we'll be <laughs> uh, 
Australian artist Catherine Britt at six o'clock, and she's got some cool stuff coming over from there. That's cool. So, tell me about what what more stuff do you want to do for uh, as as in regards to like an event promote promoter or a band leader? What are some of the uh, projects that you would like to get into more of? Um, whew. <laughs> Right now, I'm kind of mired in the middle of, of Strummer Jam. I haven't, I'm not really thinking about the next one yet. That'll probably happen five minutes after we wrap up Strummer Jam. Then I'll, you know, then I'll need something else to kind of keep me busy. Um, you know, again, I'm always, I, I, I think this idea of, you know, what the, what, what the Susan Giblin Foundation, you know, band is, you know, the, that, that organization with the, you know, the tribute albums goes over really well uh, with people. Um, anything we can do to try to make the world a better place. I know it sounds a little maybe trite and cliche, but, you know, but through entertaining people, you know, give people entertainment, you know, to get them kind of motivated to, uh, you know, participate. Right. Exactly. Um, you know, is good stuff. So, um, I, I haven't come up with anything yet. Uh, if again, this drummer jam pulls off, maybe it'll become a yearly thing. Maybe it's something we do every other year. You know, we just do when the, when, when we, it feels right, you know, We'll we'll have to see, but you know I'll I'll gladly always go forward with you know more projects that are in that vein. Yeah, it's it's always important to remember that uh, music is the way people get through a ton of things. Absolutely. And without music, what is? I'm going to think it's really deep, but without music, what is life really? Uh, you know, and and that kind of is part of the vision uh, of of Joe Strummer and, and, you know, um, you know, he, he definitely said that, you know, many, many, many times in many different ways and many of his interviews and his music and, 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 uh, his body of work that he left behind. Um, his most famous quote, I think is probably just without people, you're nothing. Um, yeah. but with that, you know, goes this, like I said, this connectivity we have to each other, uh, through music. Yeah, that's always one of my, uh, bigger goals for the podcast is, now that I've got this repertoire of musicians, I want to put together a festival just to uh, bring not only bring together the like local economy of, of Lancaster, mm-hmm. but to just showcase these wonderful smaller acts That's in great. in one central spot. Yeah, Lancaster and, and Central PA, I'll, I'll, I'll expand, is, yeah. is really, really, really fortunate to have a really, really vibrant uh, musical community. Um, you can see live music almost any night of the week. But, mm-hmm. you know, definitely every week of the year. Uh, and again, you know, TELUS is doing that awesome TELUS Three City Fest. Yeah. You know, as this well weekend, as right? Lancaster Roots and Blues, as well as, um, you know, again, you know, I like wonderful events like Strummer Jam, and, you know. But there, there's, there's something to do all the time. And, and the musicians in this region uh, are, work together fantastically they're they're involved in each other's projects you know they're they're All the time. you know exactly right we're doing this great we're we're on board you know we'll do it we'll help out you know what can i do is, is the general attitude and yeah it's so supportive and it's so open it's unlike any other uh spot really because people are it's not it's not an air of competition for yeah. anybody yeah. it's more of like an air of collaboration and an air of Oh, I'm doing this set. You should go check out that set later on. Exactly right. Yeah, we we proved, I mean, you know, as as you know, a member of the Ockham Stones, we promote all the other bands, you know, that we've ever played with. You know, like I said, we get along famously with, um, you know, many of the other bands that one might think we're supposedly competing with for for you know for stages or something like that. And it's that's not, not the way it is at all. Not at all. No, it's not. It's not a competition. It's just. Uh, opportunities, absolutely more opportunities. If you're gonna, if you're gonna make it in the music industry, at least in Lancaster, you have to make these connections. Everybody knows each other anyway. Absolutely. So if you're if you're gonna come in here and uh, act a fool, you're not gonna get nowhere. No. no, it's more it's more of a friendly. Oh, I went out to this show and they were awesome. And it's more it's more of a it's way more of a community community than I would ever thought of because. You go to New York City or Philadelphia, it's very much, very much cut in uh, throat cut. Right, right. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm infinitely thankful that it's not like that here. Yeah, it is really wonderful. 
So what are some of uh, you talk about roots and blues? Tell me about your stage managing there. Um, once again, you know, uh, very, very fortunate and lucky to know Rich Ruoff um, from my time at the Chameleon. And then when the Agam Stones were up and going, uh, you know, often very happy to see Rich in the, in the audience and stuff like that. Um, so he invited us, I can't remember any of the years, but we, we've definitely, we played a couple Roots and Blues, uh, which have always been fantastic, you know, uh, opportunities and experiences. Um, but then in the times when the Ockham Stones weren't invited to play, then Rich usually asked me if I'd work a stage for him. Because again, he, <laughs> right. back in the chameleon day, you know, he knew that I knew what to do. Um, and I think being a stage manager from a, if you're also a person who plays stages, then you get that, that other, you know, the, the, the performer's perspective. Yeah. You know, what do you want? What do you want to make a stage run properly? And um, I like to think that it's not a difficult job. It's just mainly keeping a ton of stuff straight and everybody happy. Um, but, you know, it's one of those things where if, if everything goes right in a show, you know, especially like some a festival like Roots and Blues, it's probably because the stage manager did a great job. You yeah. know, and like you know, if everything went off on the same time and all the artists had all their, wrong. if you didn't notice anything wrong, probably a stage manager did a great job. Mm -hmm. You know, which is which is in its, its own way really fulfilling. You know, just to know that man that that went off without a hitch, and you know, it was because you ran an extra you know. Uh, instrument to somebody at the right time or you managed to make sure everybody was happy when they went on stage or they had everything they needed, that kind of stuff. So um, not unlike bartending, it's just keeping a bunch of stuff straight, <laughs> you know. Uh, but the beauty of it is you get to, again, even if you're not performing, which, you know, there's always a part of me that's got that little twinge inside of me going, oh, I wish that was me up there. Mm -hmm. But, you know, knowing that you're, you're, you're making the, the performance better is, is a really fun fun aspect of the job it goes back to the making the community yeah i mean you know if the audience is happy then everybody did their job right and if the band people are happy then they're going to put on a great show they're going to put on a great show <laughs> and remember you because they'll they will remember those who did not do so well well right and exactly mm -hmm. right unfortunately every band probably has you know many more than they even want to recount you know or don't recount you know except in closed doors about the awful stages they played or the you mm -hmm. know the terrible venues that they were at you know or the places where they didn't get the support that they that they needed you know to put on a good show um and yeah those are the nightmare stories you know those are the ones that you know where everything went wrong um and you know most bands and most musicians you know still pull together professionally to do what they need to do uh, but it's tougher when you don't have that kind of support. So what, what is the, some of the support that uh, you would give advice to for other stage managers or other venues to um, give artists? Yeah, just, uh, you know, again, uh, it, it, it almost sounds like almost like a, a, a laundry list. I mean, quite literally, when you're talking about towels, it is a laundry list. You know? But <laughs> just making sure people have what they want, you know. And, and again, it doesn't mean you have to you know, have a green room that has a, you know, prime rib station in it or anything. Of course, like that. right. <laughs> right. But, you know, plenty of water, not, you know, plenty of clean towels. Um, but even more than that, it's, you know, do they feel like they're being listened to? Do they feel like, you know, sometimes you are the liaison between the sound guy who they just met 10 seconds ago when they walked in the door, you know, are, is the stage being set up properly for them? Are the, are the instruments that they need, you know, they're, they're, provided contractually are they there are they ready to go um you know are they getting the the proper amount of of, of you know sound check time mm. um and so i would just say it, it doesn't mean here's the flip side of that story and it hasn't happened in roots and blues ever i want to make that clear but back in the chameleon days there were some artists who came in who are real not, fun, not people. fun people to work with, you know, and you could do, you could try to bend over backwards and do whatever you want for them. And they're still going to be miserable, angry, you know, demanding, unpleasant people, you know, mm -hmm. and you just try and again, remember what are you here for? You're here for the people who bought tickets, you right? Know, you're here for the audience. You're here for the people who regard this unpleasant person as an idol you know, or like, you know, we're here to see that person. Um, so, 
it's not to say you have to bend over backwards. It's not to say you have to, you know, become, uh, you know, a toady or anything like that. Of course. But if you if you if you're conscious of what makes a good show work, and you work toward getting that, there's going to be a good show. What are some what is some advice for some musicians that uh, might be coming in with too big of expectations? <laughs> um, again, just be friendly and work with people. Be patient. That's that's my biggest thing. You know, uh, yeah, there's a lot of stuff going on, especially in a festival atmosphere, you know, where you're trying to get bands on stage and off stage. Mm-hmm. And again, I, I, I'll, I'll absolutely, you know, say this. Uh, I've never had a negative experience at Lancaster Roots and Blues. You know, the artists are really happy to be there. You know, they're really happy to be participating in such a great event, you know, and they come in with a positive attitude. And, you know, as long as, even when things go wrong, they're still like, Yep, what can we do to fix this? You know, how, can you help me do something to, to resolve this issue? Um, and so, yeah, if you're a musician and, you know, you're working a thing like Lancaster Roots and Blues or any, any situation where, you know, you're walking into a venue and there's somebody there to meet you saying, hi, I'm here to help you, you know, uh, just, just be polite, nice, and patient. It, I mean, truly, that's what it is. Uh, it's musicians sometimes can get too big of a head sometimes. I mean, you know, I'm not saying. Uh, yeah, I don't. I, I, luckily, I'm gonna say that my lengthy experience of working with musicians has that, that's few and far between. Luckily. Luckily. So, I want to get to some of your music. Sure. Tell me about uh, Cadences to Arms. Cadence to Arms um, is again a traditional. Uh, tune. It was um, you could kind of call it a, a marching or a military tune. Um, once again, it, it 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 fits itself to bagpipes really well, uh, which is why we recorded it with bagpipes. But then we ramp it up. We add a little bit of you know uh, rock to it, as well as a uh, an even a really brief um, tribute to metal. With that said, this is uh, Kings to Arms by the Ogham Stones. That was Kins to Arms. So tell me about uh, that piece. Like, what? What is there a, a bigger, a bigger plan for that piece, or is that just? Um, we use it as a, a as a set opener. That makes a lot of sense, actually. So yeah. you know, a lot of times we, you know, just kind of walk out on stage and start with that one, and I think it pretty well sets the tone, it you does. know, for what people are gonna get, you know, for the rest of the show. Um, it gets, you know, me rocking, my blood boiling, you know, really we launch into something usually immediately after that, that just kind of picks up with that energy. Um, and, and, you know, like I said, that, that's a great way to, to start a show. It, it would be, I'm just imagining just walk, uh, a bag, 
bagpipe player walking out onto stage just doing their own thing and it's like what's going on and then all of a sudden right 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 exactly wow and, yeah and well we just played um a week ago we played up at fort hunter park in uh harrisburg and we don't get to harrisburg too often so i i, I think it's safe to say that you know usually if people are just showing up to see us they've probably either you know uh checked us out online or something like that but I think there's still that, you know, when they when they first sit down, you know, it was kind of an outdoor, it was an outdoor venue, so a lot of people were just in basically lawn chairs in a big, you know, grassy area. And yeah, you step out and you open with that, you know, there's there's a there's a pretty good idea of wow, I, I think we're gonna have fun now. So <laughs> So talk to me about uh Country Downs. Um the County Down the county is down. no, that's fine. Um the County Down is an old traditional Irish tune. It's uh you know, it's it's um it's a song that's been sung probably a thousand ways to Sunday, you know, by in different, you know, um, you know, it's the kind of tune that you would, um, you know, you could probably walk into any pub, you know, in Ireland where there's a circle of musicians around, and eventually someone is going to play, you know, "Star of the County Down." Um, so it was one of the tunes that we knew we wanted to do, but again, we wanted to make our own. So. You know, um, I think it's got a pretty unique sound to it. This is the one I was thinking about before. Where we have a little, little, uh, little metal riff in there. You know that that you know kind of lets us know, lets you know who we are. Gotcha. With that said, this is "Counting Down" by the Occam Stones. In my Sunday clothes With a hot cock fire And my shoe shine bright With a smile from a nut brown rose No pipe all smoke No horse all yoke Till the leaves turn rust color brown Still smiling bright But my own fire sights the star of the county down From Bantry Bay and Derry Cay Galway to Dublin town No made us seem like a brown colleen That I met at the county down From Bantry Bay and Derry Cay Galway to Dublin town No made us seem like a brown colleen That I met at the county down from Battery Bay to Terry Cave, Galway to Dublin Town. No meat I seen like a brown colleen that I met at the county down. <laughs> and that was the Ogham Stone's rendition of County Down. So we have, um, tell me, do you have any gigs coming up? Any place where people can find you? Oh, absolutely. Um, well, like I said, Strummer Jam is the next big thing that I'm working on. Again, uh, August 21st at Phantom Power in Millersville. Um, uh, again, I can, uh, it's probably too long to run down a list, but you know, you're going to see uh, 
tons of amazing local musicians uh, from tons of bands uh, that you'll recognize. Um, like I said, Jet Silver, Vinegar Creek Constituency, uh, the Jelly Bricks, um, Naked Eye Ensemble, the Innocence Mission, the Split Squad, um, April Skies are all represented in one way or another. Um, you know, by uh, some of the musicians that'll be out that day, and it'll be a rocking good time. Um, and then, uh, and that's uh, like I said, ten dollars. Uh, all proceeds going to the Joe Strummer Foundation, as well as an excellent uh, raffle of tons of very generous donations. Um, it is uh, twenty-one and over, but children are welcome with a with an adult or a guardian. Um, I've actually been really, really uh, encouraged by the fact that I know a lot of parents who have said, "I'm bringing my kids to this," mm. and you know because they love the Clash, they love Joe Strummer, and unfortunately, um, after his passing in 2002, it's not going to be possible to see him anymore. So this mm. is going to be the next best thing. So I know there's a lot of parents who want their kids to be exposed. Uh, to the Clash and Joe Strummer, so this is a great way of doing that. Um, in terms of the yeah. Ogham Stones, do you guys have anything? Yeah, the Ogham Stones are going to be playing a couple of gigs in September. Um, we're going to be Friday, September twenty third. We're going to be at uh, the Englewood up in Hershey, which is an awesome uh, new uh, venue. Um, I've been there once to see uh, Chuck and Jerry in the Mud Bucket, and it's a it's a fantastic venue. A uh, great restaurant on on site, as well as a just a really really nice space, um, and the sound is incredible there. So, so we're going to be there, um, so you can get tickets to that uh, on uh, the Inglewoods website. And then the very next day uh, is the Lidditz Craft Beer Fest, and we're going to be playing that on Saturday, uh, the twenty fourth of September. So, you know, again, you know, perfect day out in the sun. You know, uh, drinking fantastic beers and listening to great music, and we're one of I think about six bands that are playing that weekend. So nice. I don't have their schedule, but yeah, we're we're playing uh, in the evening on the twenty fourth. And I'm sure you can find all of that stuff at their website www.theogamstones.com. That is O G H A M correct stones.com. You can find all that stuff there. Uh, we're gonna go off the radio and we're gonna play a few more songs uh, from the Ogham Stones. Uh, if you're on the radio and you want to f- continue following us, we can f- you can find my podcast and everything. Just search up The Story Coy Rosen, C-O-R-Y-R-O-S-E-N. You can find us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Facebook, Instagram, and you will find us there. If you want to keep up with all the events and guests, go check out our Facebook or Instagram. And with that said, we're going to get back get you guys back to the radio. So we have a few more songs for you. Uh, we have The Wild Winds. Wild Winds and Misfortune. Um, speaking of Vinegar Creek Constituency and Leo DeSanto, who I know he just had on a little while ago. Um, this is a song that Leo wrote, um, and uh, we joke all the time. We borrowed it, and we haven't given it back yet. But uh, this is our arrangement of his tune, The Wild Winds and Misfortune. Well, I recall a pal of mine when I was a lad of nine. Cheerfully oblivious of good fortunes that were mine Sausage on the table and a blessing on the day And the wild winds of misfortune only whispers far away
And now, pal, am I you meet me with an old and old? The wild winds of misfortune blow me thrice around the world. I look like hell's pajamas, and I'll soon be to my rest. So hoist the glass and sing along, and tune I know the best. song <laughs> that is i mean like i said I, I i i appreciate every day that leo let us take a swing at that and and uh I look like hell's pajamas <laughs> I look like hell's pajamas is one of the best lines I've, I've i've ever heard that is awesome so uh you he just gave it to you and let you uh arrange it and all yeah, that jazz? just you know he said i wrote the song you know and and they have it on uh uh you know if you look up uh, vinegar creek constituencies you know entire discography uh they've recorded it and it sounds brilliant when they do it as well um but he just said i just wondered what you guys would do with this and we augified it (laughs) augified (laughs) that's so cool so uh we have another song the mermaid song the mermaid song uh this is actually we we called this a bonus track on our cd when we when we we did the album um because it, it literally it's it's a, it's an old sea shanty. So it's, a, it's a, a, a song like a little jokey song about life on a ship and you know dealing with all various personalities. It's actually a much longer version of it. Mm. Uh, you'll hear them talk about the captain and then the cook and you know uh, there's other verses which run through the entire crew and talk about everybody on the ship. Um, we just did a couple verses of it. Um, I used to use this just as a as a voice a vocal warm up uh, before you know gigs because uh, it just really you know uh, gets the voice loose um and then you know kind of jokingly everybody else in the band started imitating me doing it when we got up but then uh started also you know kind of harmonizing with it and and we did you know we said you know this is actually we could we could add this to the set and and put it in um and then obviously when, when it was time to record the album we said let's throw that on kind of quote unquote as a bonus track this is the mermaid song It was Friday morn when we set sail and we were not far from the land When a captain he spied a mermaid so fair with a comb and a glass in her hand And the ocean waves did roll and the stormy winds did blow and we poor sailors were skipping up the top While the land lovers lie down below, below, below While the land lovers lie down below And up spoke the captain of our gallant ship And a fine-spoken man was he Said this fishy mermaid is warning of our doom We shall sink to the bottom of the sea And the ocean waves did roll And the stormy winds did blow and we poor sailors were skipping up the top While the land lovers lie down below, below, below While the land lovers lie down below And up spoke the cookie of our gallant ship And a cranky old bastard was he Said I care much more for my pots and my pans Than I do for the bottom of the sea And the ocean waves did roll And the stormy winds did blow and we poor sailors were skipping up the top While the land lovers lie down below, below, below While the land lovers lie down below And three times round won our gallant ship And three times round went she And three times round won our gallant ship And she sank to the bottom of the sea And the ocean waves did roll And the stormy winds did blow and we poor sailors were skipping at the top While the land lovers lie down below, below, below While the land lovers lie down below <laughs> What a fun song. Thanks. Yeah, it, is, it is, like I said, you know, uh, 
somewhat unintentional that it made it on the on the uh, CD, but I'm glad it's there. And you can find all that CD stuff on on your website as well. Yeah, uh, um, all that uh, is up on as tracks as well as some uh, live stuff uh, that we've recorded in the past. Um, it's all up on the www.theagamstones.com. Well, I have some final questions for you, and sure. then we'll, we'll go ahead and wrap it up. So tell me, what is one thing that you know now about the music industry, any any aspect of it, that you wish you had known when you first started? <laughs> um, don't try to make a CD in six weeks. That's uh, smart. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's, that's actually, you know, the, the, how we did that. Uh, the CD that we have out, the album that we have out, was um, literally kind of time got away from us. We usually, you know, take off. We usually play song, play gigs all the way through the fall, and then right around Christmas time, we'll sometimes do and and we look forward to doing it again this year, like a Celtic Christmas show, usually at Telus down in the Speakeasy, which is awesome, um, where we mix in our versions of a bunch of Christmas tunes uh, mm. to our set. And it's a nice, intimate uh, little little room down there. So we love doing that. And then we take off, usually until St. Patrick's. Um, really? Because St. Patrick's Day, as you can imagine, is probably a little crazy for us. Uh, sometimes we play multiple gigs in a day, wow. as well as you know playing like whatever day St. Patrick's Day falls on. It's usually the two days before and the four days after. You know, we're just playing shows the entire thing. So we like to take off time to gear up for that. So one year when, uh, you know, I said, you know, we, we've got enough, you know, stuff together that we should, you know, definitely get it recorded and have CDs for sale at our shows. Uh, I didn't start that process maybe till January. Mm. <laughs> so uh, in order to, to have enough time to record them, mix them, master them, and have them printed, all in all was about six weeks. And I literally got the first box of, of our CDs delivered to my door like the day before our first St. Patrick's Day gig that year. Um and it was a nightmare. I mean, it was it was fun when we were in the studio doing it, but the logistics and everything like that, you know, uh, yeah, don't don't record a CD in six weeks. Yeah, that definitely should be at <laughs> least a longer process. Oh, there are people who take years to, to yeah, come right, <laughs> with albums, um, and and God love them, you know, that, right, of course. <laughs> right. Uh, so, what are some of the mis- mistakes that you personally have made? Within your career, and what are some advice you can give Oof. to curtail or booking? Booking's okay. always, you know, rough, and it was it was definitely when I got into um, being the the for the most part the manager of the band as well as you know the lead singer. Um, I made some horrible booking, not only decisions but just you know snafus when it comes to not ensuring that you know. The, the, the venue had what we needed to, to mm. play or that the sound was going to be right and everything like that. Um, so yeah, if I had to teach a little seminar, I'd teach it, you know, I'd teach one of like, you know, booking 101, you know, how to make sure that you, <laughs> you not only get everything you need up front, but that, you know, uh, you know the venues uh, know who to expect. Uh, you know, yeah. we definitely had some places just book us for, you know, and then we show up with, like I said, seven people and like, you know, literally 20 different instruments and they have no ability to to you know get us the right inputs or mix us properly or you know anything like that and um you know we've we've definitely played some uh, what i would say are historically bad <laughs> gigs in the past but again they're always learning experiences, learning experiences i walked sure. away from it going okay we're never going to do that again you know or you know uh you know next time i'll know what to ask and and you know uh, get a lot, you know, more of my stuff down on paper that I can send to people, and you know, yeah, this, this input is, lists and stage plots and that kind of stuff. It's something I've been learning throughout this podcast. Is okay. What what is the list of things I need to tell people? Right. <laughs> what is the list of things that I need to do? What's the list of things? And it's ever expanding every single day. Absolutely. I make mistakes like everyone else does every single yeah. day. Yeah. Um. Definitely, and it's not. It's not. It's okay to uh, make those mistakes. Is, is another important thing that you need to learn that it's okay because they ha- they they happen. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, like I said, when I when I talk about historically bad shows, I mean maybe they were bad for us, you know, because we knew we were putting out the kind of show that we know we can do. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I think when it comes down to it, and I'm saying this with very little modesty, you know, we're one of the best live local bands, you know, in in PA and 
you know, when, when everything's going the way it's supposed to go, you know, and um, when it doesn't, and you know that you're putting together or putting out something that, you know, not because of our energy or our desire, but, you know, because of technical issues, because of, you know, uh, you know, sound issues, whatever else it is, it's, you know, yeah, it can be a little discouraging and sometimes even maybe a little embarrassing, you know, to be up on a stage yeah. knowing that you're not, you know, putting out exactly what the best thing you possibly can. But as long as, like I said, there's a learning curve, you know, that follows that up to say next time we're going to make sure this doesn't happen or mm -hmm. that we make sure that, you know, through preparation, you know, we're, we're prepared to deal with this issue, that kind of thing. So, yeah, it's definitely be prepared to make mistakes and then prepared to learn from those mistakes. Absolutely correct. For sure. Absolutely. So what is some of the funniest or worst things to ever happen <laughs> to you on, on stage? Um, it usually has to do with crowd stuff. Um, you know, here's a, a playing, you know, being an Irish band and playing on St. Patrick's Day, you know, uh, you're definitely going to play to some rocky, uh, rowdy, <laughs> raucous, you know, crowds, maybe that have, you know, uh, been in their cups for, you know, quite some time, even before you get there. You right. Know, that kind of thing. Um, again, a famous story I've, we've told before uh, was at Telus 360. Uh, we were playing the pub stage in the front when they had a stage up there. Um, and there was a flight of steps that was, you know, came up to the stage, but it was directly in front of my microphone. <laughs> and, uh, you know, a guy who you could definitely tell who was dressed as a leprechaun, um, you know, took it upon himself to start running up and down the steps, uh, you know, running up, turning around, running back down, running up, turning around, running back down, kind of the me, 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 you know, <laughs> I know you're gotcha, all here, right, right, I know right. you're all here to watch a band, but I want you to look at me for a little while. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, that was, uh, we tried to, you know, uh, despite the fact that it's annoying, you don't want to be angry on stage, you know, of course. you want to, <laughs> so we're, you know, we, we kind of incorporated, we just like, okay, look at that guy, ha, 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 you know, that kind of thing. Um, you know, those kind of things. Uh, but for the most part, I, I can't really ever say that, you know, we had ever anything that was just, you know, so bad that it ruined a show, mm. you know. I mean, you push through, you know, no matter what's going on. You know, you just push through and you, you endeavor to put on the best possible show you can to make sure that your audience, you know, got what they came for. How about any funny experiences from the community club? Oh, uh, that was mostly staff shenanigans, and it's you know, almost all like after hours stuff. Um, yeah, it, it was a, it was a fantastic staff. I mean, between the other bartenders, uh, the uh, you know all the doormen we had working there, you know, um, uh, we just you know we we enjoyed each other all the time. Um, you know, lots and lots and lots of. You know, again, I'm going to say backstage kind of shenanigans and stuff like that that went on. Um, as far as bands go, um, no, nothing I'm really coming up with off the top of my head. Sorry. No, no, no yeah. worries. Well, hey, this has been a lot of fun. Uh, be sure to go check out all of the Ogham Stone stuff and Shremmer Street, uh, Shremmer Jam, uh, August 21st. August 21st, Phantom Power in Millersville. At noon. At noon. Ten, uh, $10 tickets. $10 tickets. All proceeds go to the Joe Strummer Foundation. And then check out the Ogham Stones on their website to go see them when when they're performing in September. Yep. And then St. Patrick's Day. We've already got our, we've already got most of our main uh, bookings settled for St. Patrick's Day, so that's awesome. Yeah, so if you want to uh, follow us on the podcast, if you enjoy what I'm doing and want to support what I'm doing, follow us, The Story Podcast, or The Story, Corey Rosen, C-O-R-Y-R-O-S-E-N. Check out our merchandise <laughs> if you would really like to support. That's the only way I currently make money right now. So please, if you would like to support me, do it that way. If you want to check out some upcoming guests, tomorrow we have Greg Fleury. He's a cellist composer. Uh, he's coming on tomorrow at two o'clock, and then on Sunday, probably one of my, probably what's going to be one of my most interesting people I've had on yet would be Daryl Davis. Oh yeah. Yeah. If you don't know who he is, he's a, a jazz musician, black jazz musician, who over the course of his years has de-radicalized over a hundred or so KKK members by actually going to the rallies and talking, you know, talking to them through that. So I'm really excited to hear about what he 
has to say. And he's performed with people like with Chuck Berry and uh, mm. Chubby Checker and all these insanely influential artists. So definitely check out that interview. That'll be on Sunday at 3 o'clock. With all that said, I hope you guys have a wonderful rest of your day. And we'll see you guys later. Bye. Thanks very much, Corey. Yeah, no problem, man.